Uh, okay, we're going to continue talking about the Oxfording pictures. This one is called Finding the Traces of the Ox. And uh, yeah, right, thank you. And I'll, uh, oh, there's a lot of reflections. It just shows the, the herdsman, the young man in this case, sees some footprints. <laughs> so I don't know if you're seeing reflections over there. Yeah. He's uh, looking, looking for his true self, and he sees a few little footprints in the sand or wherever um, on the trail. And um, <clears throat> at this stage, you have some <clears throat> cerebral understanding of the existence of the ox, and uh, but. And part of that comes from actual practice, you know. Um, for example, uh, if you're focusing on your breath, uh, usually when we first start meditation, our mind is always racing. And uh, there might be a moment, you know, where the mind quiets down and you feel a little spacious. So you say, wow. There might really be something here, you know, and all of these Zen masters haven't been deceiving me. Um, so if you're, uh, you know, working on the koan mu, Joshua's mu, you, there might be a moment where you get out of the way and there's just mu. And uh, as a result, your faith in the practice grows and you begin to believe that maybe even you can realize your true self. <laughs> I was uh, practicing for a number of years, and <clears throat> my Zumi Roshi used to always say that everybody has the Buddha nature, and I, I thought everybody has Buddha nature except me, because I just couldn't realize it. And so I said, do you mean everybody? And he says, sure, 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 you know, so everybody. So there's a commentary on the on this stage that goes like this. <clears throat> Reading the sutras and hearing the teachings have enabled the herdsman to grasp something of the meaning of the truth intellectually. He's found the traces and now he understands that things are all of the same gold however differently they may be formed, and that the nature of each thing is not different from his own. Nevertheless, <clears throat> he still cannot distinguish between what's genuine and what is not, not to mention between the true and the false. He cannot yet pass through the gate. It is therefore provisionally said that he has only found the traces. So at some point when you started practicing this, these appearance of these traces were enough to uh, encourage you to continue. And that's kind of what this stage is. Now, when I first started practice, being a scientist, I approached it in a scientific way and uh, so the, the real test was, does it, does it work as described by the Zen masters? And uh, whenever students would question the teachings and say that they don't not sure they're true or not, I say that, well, you just have to find out for yourself. You don't, don't take anybody else's word for it. You know, you don't have to believe anything but you have to practice and uh, experience it for yourself. And I once had a, a woman come up to me and say, well, I've been practicing for a whole week. You know, <laughs> I'd say, well, that's good. <laughs> you need many more weeks. <laughs> Keep practicing. So um, when I first started to sit, 
I would go to a weekend session and my mind would be racing almost the whole time with all kinds of things. However, if there was one moment, just one second, when my mind would quiet down I, and I felt my presence expand, that was enough for me to come back to another session and suffer through it again, you know. So, um, gosh, that was probably, that was more about 55 years ago or something like that when I first started. And um, I use sometimes a story that I used to, I took up golf to do something with my father when he was alive, but I was a terrible golfer and I didn't really, um, wasn't a student of the game, but if I had one par in 18 holes, um, there was enough for me to want to come back and do it again. It's kind of like if I had a few moments of silence in my mind. And, and the more I practiced, you know, the more it um, would expand. And I took my zazen seriously. I didn't take golf seriously. It wasn't very rewarding, and so I dropped it. But um, uh, <clears throat> so over the next few months, I'll be talking about all 10 of these ox herding pictures, the different stages. And, but uh, don't expect to go through the 10, 10 stages in 10 weeks. It won't come that easily. <clears throat> So some of you have been sitting for several years and some just for a few years or even less. And uh, when he was about to retire as the abbot of Antaji Monastery in Kyoto, Uchiyama Roshi's final words were, and, the, and somebody brought this up at the last, end of last session, is to, he said to sit 10 years. And they said, what after that? And he said, sit another 10 years. And then after that, sit another 10 years. And uh, that advice just keeps multiplying, you know, that this practice is endless. We just keep doing it. In uh, case 91 of the Book of Equanimity, uh, it quotes Dharma Master Joe who said, heaven and earth have the same root. The 10,000 things are one body. Heaven and earth have the same root and the 10,000 things are one body. And that's one of the things that we might consider when we're looking for the traces. So, so <clears throat> if there's an I that understands this, <clears throat> then the I remains. So, but Joe, it's interesting, he was sentenced to death <clears throat> for disobeying an imperial order. He asked for seven days stay of execution to finish his uh, essay, which encapsulated his understanding. So I thought about it that if you were, or I, we're sentenced to death. What would we do in those seven days? Say the beginning of session and say, well, at the end of session, you're all going to be executed. How would your session be? <laughs> yeah. So the road to the true self is not for the weak of heart and the casual meditator. Those are, who are just curious will quickly be disappointed and maybe even disappear. There has to be a deep longing in your heart and a fire burning in your gut. You have to be willing to plunge into the abyss of the unknown. And you have to be willing to surrender your, what you think is control to something other than your fragmented ego. And in fact, it's a state in which you have absolutely no control. 
So this stage in uh, seeing the traces is equivalent to surrender, to surrender to the teachings, to the path or submission. There's all kinds of submission. And, and at the deep, deepest level, it means to submit to the Buddha way by submitting to the practice of letting go of attachments and dualistic thoughts. This is the same as submitting to not knowing. See, knowing gives us a false sense of security and superiority. So not knowing is a kind of submission. The Dogen wrote in one of his um, chapters or fascicles, uh, one called the, um, the awesome presence of active Buddhas. He said, thoroughly practice, thoroughly practicing, thoroughly clarifying is not forced. It's just like recognizing <clears throat> the shadow of deluded thought and turning the light around to shine within. The clarity of clarity beyond clarity prevails in the activity of Buddhas. This is totally surrendering to practice. To understand the meaning of totally surrendering, you should thoroughly investigate your mind in the steadfastness of thorough investigation all phenomena are the unadorned clarity of mind so surrender is not passive it's uh, an intentional giving up of the ego grasping self and spiritual work is not about comfort Spiritual work is about an increased surrender to the presence of Buddha nature in one's life, or the true self or truth in one's life. <clears throat> there was a, a verse written about this stage by uh, Master Kakuan, and he, it goes like this. Traces of the ox are clustered here and there under the trees by the side of the water. Has the herdsman found the way among the thick, sweet grass? However far the ox may run, even to the furthest place in the mountains, his nose reaches to the sky so that he cannot conceal himself. So the first line says, traces of the ox are clustered here and there under the trees by the side of the water. So wherever you look, it's there. So tell me what is not the traces. So we chant Dharma gates are omnipresent. I vow to experience them. We don't vow to intellectually understand them. Experience requires we use our whole body. And omnipresent means present in all places and at all times. And we chant you don't see the way you don't see it even as you walk on it but always there are the traces wherever we look we see them has a herdsman found the way through thick sweet grass so the sweet smelling grass spread out abundantly and are swaying in the wind Again, it's a reference to our true self. Wherever we are, it's there. Now we can see it, hear it, receive and maintain it. And you can smell it. 
So can you swallow it down in one gulp and start to digest it? So however far the ox may run, even to the furthest place in the mountains. So if you pursue the ox, it recedes further and further from you into the mountains. Try to grab it and it moves. But sometimes the ox appears as frustration. Sometimes it appears as anger. Sometimes as joy. Sometimes it appears as sadness. And sometimes it appears as fear. What's the best way to deal with it? You try to push it away and it returns. Try to pursue it and it runs away. As long as there's a gap between you and yourself, the ox has disappeared among the distant peaks. See this ox, we're calling it an ox, but it's actually difficult to describe what it is. Because we don't quite know what we're looking for, you know? Everybody has an idea what's, if we, if we hear the word enlightenment, I don't know, what associations come up with it. So, so we all have something, picks a picture. So in a way that can be inhibiting because we have this picture, this has to be it. So everything else can come by and you don't notice it, you know? I think I told this story many times, but you know, about the man who prayed to God all the time. He was very righteous and uh, where he was living was caught in a flood. And so he, he prayed to God, you know, to save him and save everybody. And the, the water came up above his door and some people came by with a boat to save him. He says, God will save me. And the water kept rising up to the second floor and they came with another boat. He said, come on, get in, we'll save you. And he said, no, God will save you. Then it rose, he was on his roof. And a helicopter came to save him. He says, God will save me. Then the water washes over the house and he drowns and dies. He goes up to heaven because he's righteous and he has an interview with God. And he says, why didn't you save me? And God said, what do you mean? I sent two boats and a helicopter. Yeah. But we don't see it sometimes. It's right there. We're expecting something else. That's, I guess he expected a the heavens to open up and a golden ladder to descend from the clouds and the angels to come down and then, uh, you know, take him wherever he had to go. <laughs> yeah. But the last line says that the, the ox's nose reaches to the sky so he cannot conceal himself. So this line is an encouragement and a warning. See, even if the ox tries to hide in the distant mountains, his nostrils always show themselves. So we're constantly revealing ourselves as the ox, but yet we don't realize it. And that's what the stage is. We just don't see it. Not yet. It's going to be a few more stages before we see it. So one of um, Hakuin's successors, Torye Zenji, wrote this verse called the Bodhisattva's Vow. And in the, the start of it goes like this. When I, as a student of the Dharma, look at the real form of the universe, all is a never failing manifestation of the myriad, mysterious truth of Tathagata. All is a never-failing manifestation of the mysterious truth of Tathagata. 
Tathagatas of Buddha. In any event, in any moment, and in any place, none can be other than the marvelous revelation of its glorious light. This realization made our founding teachers and virtuous Zen leaders extend tender care with the heart of worshiping to animals and birds and indeed to all beings. This realization teaches us that our daily food, drink, clothes, and protections of life are the warm flesh and blood, the merciful incarnation of Buddha. Who can be ungrateful and not respectful to each and everything as well as to human beings? So everything that we see, everything we feel, everything we think is the ox, the traces of the ox. It's always right in front of us. So nothing can be other than the marvelous revelation, the mysterious truth, the manifestation of the mysterious truth. So, The important thing is to let go of whatever we're holding on to. <clears throat> and maybe you think you're going to see the ox with your eye. <laughs> yeah. I think it was Tozan who said to chant with your ears. So where is the ox? So this talks about seeing the traces, but seeing it means having right vision, but right vision can include anything and everything. So, so think about what is it? <clears throat> what are the traces in your life that brought you here? It'd be interesting. Maybe we that's what we can share. So that's all that I want to say. So let's open it up. If any of you want to share what traces brought you. That would be interesting.